without further ado, Zach Miller and I have uh, had a lot of conversations recently and over over time of all the things that we are trying to help fix and people to understand legally within the Fourth Amendment and according to your state's case law. So we decided we're going to try to do one of these podcasts, maybe even weekly, to give everybody some real context and insight on what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and give them some guidance on how the law actually reads and some clarification because we have a lot of misnomers in this profession regarding what's good and what's not, and it's a nonstop battle for us. So we figured, why not reach the masses in a podcast? So without uh, any further interruption, I'm going to let Zach Miller introduce himself and give himself a little bit of a history of who he is so you can find him trustworthy in his professional legal opinions when we start to discuss topics. Go ahead, Zach. All right. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so I'm Zach Miller. I have been a, I am a police officer. I've been a police officer for a little over 17 years now, uh, or six, 16 and a half, 16 and a half years. Um, I'm out in Virginia, Southeastern Virginia. Um, we work, I'm at about 115 officer agency. I'm the training manager for the department. I've been in that role for about uh, five years now. I was a patrol officer my entire career up until then. Um, so I've been teaching uh, legal issues for about probably about 14 years now, um, mostly constitutional law, some Virginia specific stuff and DUI law, but mostly uh, my area of expertise is constitutional law, um, search and seizure, interrogation law and that kind of stuff. I teach at our, our local academy um, and um, been doing that for, like I said, about 14 years. Uh, just started teaching uh, in other states. Um, Fourth Amendment issues, and um, I'm glad to be with you guys. Uh, I really enjoy um, answering the legal questions, which there are plenty of them, um, and there is a lot of uh, misinformation floating on around there, around the country, like you said, and it's the same issues over and over again. It doesn't matter where I teach, who I talk to, the same uh, misinformation is, is out there, so trying to do our small part and, and rectify that. Yeah, we have become basically the legal resource for the country at this point. For those who of us, uh, for those people in our Facebook group and who are following and listening to the podcast, man, we, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many emails I get a day asking for legal answers to questions. And unfortunately, I just won't be able to get to all of them. So we're going to try to do this on a platform and try to express, you know, much more clarity and maybe try to curtail some of the emails that are coming in and answer some questions. And we thought for the first episode of him and I doing this together and discussing legals, uh, items and, and issues, what better way to start than one of the, mis the one of the biggest confused or causing confusion things, as simple as it may sound, is the automobile exception to the written warrant requirement founded in Carroll versus United States 1925 and then expanded upon in a few additional cases we go on throughout the uh, course and history of the U.S. Supreme Court and, you know, your localized courts as well. And some of the misconceptions are you know, very, very common. People are not understanding them. And Zach and I, we did talk a little bit before we got on here about some of the things we would uh, address and discuss. We were just trying to memorize the things that we hear the most of. Um, I don't know if you have a place that you want to start, but I can tell you the conversation topic today in our Facebook group was searching a parked car. Actually, I had three emails on it just before I got on here, searching a parked car with probable cause. And I think it's a good place to start. So maybe you could start with the automobile exception, what it means, what it says, and why we're allowed to do the automobile exception and search a car with probable cause without having to go and seek judicial authorization from a third-party magistrate uh, or neutral and detached magistrate, and uh, what authorizes that, and when we can apply those circumstances and in many facets and situations. So without further uh, interruption, again, back to Zach. Yeah, um, so I guess I probably will just start with the beginning with Carol and Sue, because and, and then we'll talk about how we got to where we are now. Um, everyone's familiar with Carol versus the United States. It uh, came out in 1925. It's one of the oldest Fourth Amendment cases uh, we have uh, in the Supreme Court. It's not the oldest, but it is definitely one of the oldest. Uh, and it's um, frequently referred to the automobile exception as the Carol Doctrine. Uh, and and if, if you ever said that, everyone would know what it is you're talking about. But um, it's a slightly misleading because... The automobile exception over the last almost 100 years has come to mean more than what Carroll initially said. So it's it's developed quite a bit since 1925. It's much broader uh, in scope and in justification than the initial Carroll case. Carroll was based completely on the mobility of the vehicle, the exigency associated with searching a vehicle on the side of the road uh, with probable cause, the fact that it was not practical for officers to leave the scene and go get a search warrant. 
Uh, they encountered Carol's vehicle. They weren't expecting to find him, so they didn't have a warrant in hand already. Um, so that it was truly an exigent circumstance uh, type of a search, uh, time sensitive based upon the mobility of the vehicle. But since um, Carol, there have been about two dozen U.S. Supreme Court cases that have dealt with the automobile exception. Uh, and more there, it's, it's changed more. It's not just the mobility of the vehicle that justifies searching it without a warrant. Uh, one thing that's uh, one factor that's just as relevant, even probably more significant, is the reduced expectation of privacy that the Supreme Court has assigned to motor vehicles, uh, beginning probably with um, initially with Coolidge versus New Hampshire, um, but it really started to get rolling in the 70s and then and then the mid 80s with um, uh, culminating in California versus Carney where the court said it's the, the reduced expectation of privacy associated with motor vehicles uh, is an additional justification for searching a vehicle. Um, vehicles when you say reduced expectation of privacy, I don't mean to interrupt you, but just have a little banter back and forth. Compared to, just a tad. Yeah, that's compared to very, homes or even the person or body, right? So as far as the hierarchy of Fourth Amendment authority, as far as degrees of privacy protected by the Fourth Amendment, the home is right at, it's at the top. Uh, followed closely behind by the person, your body, yourself, uh, and all the way down at the bottom is, is motor vehicles. Uh, you do have an expectation of privacy. It is a constitutionally protected area, uh, but that, that expectation of privacy is significantly less than a home. They're normally encountered in areas, uh, in public areas, areas accessible to the public, so people passing by can see what's going on in your car. Uh, they're heavily regulated by the government. Uh, and also, uh, you normally don't store extremely personal items in your car like you would in your home. These have all been justifications the court has used over the years to call cars uh, or get to assign a reduced expectation of privacy to cars. Cool. So back to so where you where we left off today with our, our discussion on on, on on the group is the mobility of the vehicle. The only significance of that now in the automobile exception is the fact is it does it look like a vehicle that works does it have four wheels does it look like it has a motor in it is it a is it apparently an operable vehicle not imminently operable but it does it look like a functioning car that's the first test on carol and that's it for exigency that is the exigent component there is no separate exigency required beyond the inherent mobility in a vehicle in general I'm going to jump in and just say, when you say a vehicle, are we talking about all vehicles with motors that accelerate and move? Anything that's self-propelled and is designed or primarily used for transportation. Um, the Supreme Court has only assigned, uh, or has only deter uh, held ca uh, decided cases with under the automobile exception with vehicles like cars uh, and an RV in Kearney. But uh, lower courts, federal courts of appeals, state courts have uh, upheld searches of boats motorcycles, tractor trailers, including the trailer, uh, towed trailers, uh, anything that is attached to a vehicle that is designed or is being used primarily for transportation uh, searches, warrantless searches have been upheld under the automobile exception. Yeah. With a motor though, right? It's not going to work for a bicycle. Correct. Yeah, it's got to be something designed for self-propulsion, um, although you could probably make some kind of an exigent circumstance argument uh, for a bike. They would Electric bike? Perhaps, yeah, but it wouldn't fall under the true automobile exception, I don't think. Uh, okay. Planes, airplanes have also been uh, upheld. Airplanes, airplane searches. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the cases we were talking about earlier today, uh, Pennsylvania versus LeBron and, and Maryland versus Dyson, the court made it clear. Uh, I don't. It can't be interpreted any other way. They said categorically, uh, there is no separate exigency requirement under the automobile exception beyond the inherent mobility of the vehicle itself. So the only thing you, the only thing else you need is probable cause uh, and a right of access to the vehicle. And I guess I'll get into that in a little bit. When we talk about Collins versus Virginia mm -hmm. um, probable cause. And it looks like a normal functioning car. You can search it without a warrant under the Fourth Amendment uh, automobile exception. Right. So when you say that, what we're saying is there are some states that have parted ways from the Supreme Court of the United States and the Fourth Amendment and have made the restrictions or the, the, the rules more strict for police officers in their state, requiring them to actually stop minus inherent exigency and go get a search warrant for the vehicle without consent. Obviously, consent is an accepted form of, um, you know, uh, without a warrantless to do a warrantless search. Some of those states off the top of my head, I know New Hampshire is one of them. 
Uh, we now have Pennsylvania. They reverse the ruling. Uh, New Mexico happens to be another one of them. And you know what? Actually, as a police officer in New Jersey for the time that I was here, we lost our exception in 2001 and we didn't get it back till 2015. So I literally worked majority of my career, actually all of my career, without the automobile exception to the written warrant requirement, which at the time I felt was a pain in the in the butt. But what I found was it forced me to get my consent abilities very, very, very good. I could communicate well. I could almost guarantee 99.5% of the time I would get consent. And I wasn't being deceptive. I wasn't playing psychological ploys. I merely explained what your options were and how it was going to go. And by the way, I wasn't afraid to call a canine, have an indication, and impound and apply for a search warrant. Subsequently, in 2015, we had it reversed back to what it was in 1981 in New Jersey. So we now have the automobile exception restored in the state with some caveats, but our caveats are not challenging or, or an extreme hurdle. I'm sure you've seen some of the unforeseeable and spontaneous. You've read some of that stuff. It, it's really almost the same, just about the same. So uh, just so we're clear with everybody, if you're in a state and you should know as a police officer whether or not when you develop probable cause in a motor vehicle stop or in a motor vehicle setting, whether or not you would need to apply for a search warrant. But you know what's crazy, Zach? I, I literally went to the academy, my third one, and I had no idea what to do in the state of New Jersey when a car smelled like weed. That's, you know, I had great, I had really shiny boots. I knew how to do a, I could march like I was the Marine Corps drill team. I could run six miles, do 60 push ups. You know, I was there, but I literally had nothing. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing legally. Nothing. I didn't even know what, what are you doing? We're stopping cars. Like, it smells like weed. What do we do? I don't know. Field training didn't tell us. You know what I mean? Like, I was, so that's, that's, that's what I was dealing with. You, I don't, I don't, I, I, it, I, don't understand how anyone can do this job successfully without having a solid legal understanding. I mean, you have to know what your legal authority is. That's just step one in every encounter. So that, yeah, that just baffles me. Well, but and I think know about it. You, you know, the biggest problems we have in this, in this profession, besides politics and, and, um, you know, poor leadership, which is really the top of our issues. But the second or third thing down is, how do we train cops to not to know what they're supposed to do legally? Literally, 99% of police officers come out of a police academy and have no idea what to do. They don't even know in simple situations what to do. And field training has failed them as well because their field training officers were failed through the academy. It's just this over and over process. And I always remind people it's not malicious intent on behalf of the police of how they screw up or why they screw up. It's a lack of training, a lack of education, a lack of understanding of what they can do. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of malice in what we – our mistakes are not malicious. Yeah, they're, no. they're due to a lack of training and, and um, understanding, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to mention, you talked about state law deviations. That's a very important point. Um, you know, obviously we get a lot of questions on the group about automobile exception, and I always try to qualify my answer under the Fourth Amendment automobile exception, you know, um, because most states, the vast majority of states follow the automobile except the Fourth Amendment auto automobile exception to a T. Uh, there are a handful, and you, you mentioned a bunch of them. I know Alaska is another one. Mm -hmm. I think Montana. Um, the main deviations are uh, Pennsylvania is probably the most restrictive in that you have to have a true exigency even to initiate the search. And I think there's a couple other states too. Um, other ones uh, allow the search until the police get custody of the car. Um, it, say arrest the driver or something like that. Then you would need a warrant. But this, it's just a small minority of states. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that do that. So, um, so our discussion today is about the Fourth Amendment automobile exception, uh, bearing in mind your state may be slightly more restrictive. Yeah. And, and if you're listening to this and you think you may have more restrictions, you know, I would implore everybody to do the research. We, we've offered the tools of how to do this research. You can reach out to us if you need some clarification. If you can try to figure it out yourself first, that'd be great because we're so friggin' busy. But you can rely on the on the things you're hearing here. And if somebody is deviating from this answer or saying what we're advocating is incorrect and we're providing factual data or citing cases, what I anticipate or urge everybody or implore everybody here to do is if you are having pushback from somebody who is adversarial about our position on what we're advocating to you, I would request legal documentation that that dictates what we're saying is incorrect. And that's the only way to have the conversation. People will call me and say, my lieutenant says this. My sergeant says this. My coworkers say this. My captain says this. I understand what they say. I understand what they think. They may have heard that somewhere, and I'm pathetic to that. But here at this company and why we've been so successful is we have read it. Here are three legal documents that are binding 
that say what we're advocating is correct in your state or this state or whatever it may be, where does it say in their legal documents that they're providing, which they're not providing, that what this says is incorrect or what we're advocating is incorrect? And when you bring that to me, we'll, we'll take a look at it. And a lot of times people will bring stuff to us, right, Zach? And it, they'll be misinterpreting what it means. That's a very common thing. It doesn't say it doesn't mean that. Uh, you know, it actually does. And I've actually, one of the first encounters I had with a gentleman who uh, was one of these people who were really, I guess when I started training nine years ago, he became subject to what I was addressing and his lack of intelligence regarding this, regarding case law become exposed. And he's decided he was going to step in and voice his opinion. And he says, well, I read case law. And there was a conversation with me and three shift commanders at my, at my police department having on a phone call. And this guy, and they're like, who is this guy? He's like, He's so wrong. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. And the, and the, this guy just kept saying like seven or eight different topics. Well, we can agree to disagree. There's there's nothing to agree to disagree about. There's an interpretation of the law. And if there is some kind of confusion, I think we, we really look left and right and maybe try to find our people, our cohorts to try to help us understand. Are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing? Are you understanding? This guy was off in La La Land and he tried to you know really ruffle feathers for me and, and sling mud and and run interference. Because now what was happening is people were being exposed that they actually didn't know what they were talking about. Oh, I read case law. And people just, nobody else reads it. So when he says it, they're like, oh, if he says it, he must be correct. He's a sergeant here, right? It's the craziest thing. And this guy to this day has this problem with me. I'll never say his name or where he's from. Uh, and it's absolutely absurd that he has no humility to just lay the sword down and say, yeah, I was wrong. Um, and he's been told time and time again how wrong he was beyond me because I know this because I have friends that work at his police agency. He still don't want to hear it. So um, I, I just want to put that out there. There's a lot of things that I understand you're struggling with when you're hearing podcasts like this and you're going back and you're now trying to resolve matters at your agency. We're giving you the answers and they're going to still push back. So having the legal stuff in front of you, the documentation, it's going to be paramount to you uh, advocating your point and, and holding your position just like we do at this company. This guy said this. Yeah, well, here it is. And I mean, it's in it's in writing. You know, I mean, there's only one way to interpret it. Well, we don't see it that way. Well, I understand because you guys are friggin' idiots. So that's why you don't see it that way. Have some humility and open your mind up to understanding and learning something new. And we're trying to help provide that. We have to now do something in this industry in law enforcement to fix some of the controversy uh, and the problems we have. We can't. We can no longer just sit around saying this is the status quo. It's the way it's always been. Nobody knows anything. We just get by and make shit up and da da da. And, or go, you know, make it up as we go. We can't do that. We have to actually have responsibility to know how to behave in the field. And again, not malicious intent. I'm talking about legally. So we are not facing the consequences of heavy scrutiny from the media or legal consequences. But I don't want to rant and rave. I just wanted to give some clarification. So I'm going to get it back to Zach. Well, to you know, on. you made a, I want to make two points about what you're talking about. You know, I, I get, um, I get questions all the time, just like you do legal questions. And I always try to support my answer with, with a case, you know, this, um, this is my answer and this is why, you know, don't, don't just take my word for it, you know, read it for yourself. And I'll, I'll sometimes I'll even give you the page number or whatever, but um, yeah, everything we do here when it comes to giving legal opinions or legal advice, or um, it's going to be supported by case law. You know, and then my second point is, you know, just because it is legal, you know, you, if you ask me for a legal opinion or a legal a question, ask me a legal question, I'm gonna give you a legal answer. The legal authority is just the baseline. This, you, you can't do anything lower than this, but this is what you can do, but I'm not in any way suggesting or advocating you must do this. You must search this car without a warrant. I'm just telling you, you can search it without a warrant legally. Um, look at, then you would, you know, once you, once you know what your, what the law allows, you next consult your policy, agency policy. What does the policy say? Hopefully the policy uh, has the law as, as a foundation, uh, but maybe your policy is more restrictive. Okay, and that's fine. Then follow the policy. All right, then you look to your training. What does our training say in these kinds of situations? What kind of tactics have I been trained to employ? Just because I can kick a door down under the Fourth Amendment and barge into a home without a warrant doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the most uh, wise or tactically sound way to address it. Um, but you got to know what the legal authority is first. You got to know what you can do. And then now you have your options about how you can proceed. So that, you know, that I think sometimes people get angry 
uh, when I say, well, you can search that car without a warrant. Well, there's nobody there. I'm not saying you have to. I'm just telling you, you can legally search that car without a warrant. And if you find anything, it's not going to be, uh, it shouldn't be suppressed. And, and, and all courts are bound to follow Supreme Court case law when it comes to uh, constitutional issues. Uh, if, the, if they are deciding the case under the Fourth Amendment, I don't care if it's your low level district trial court, whatever you call it, or your state Supreme Court, if it's a Fourth Amendment question, it's been clearly answered by the U.S. Supreme Court, and they're deciding it under the Fourth Amendment. They are bound to follow the law. In order to be more restrictive, it has to be under a, a state constitutional provision or a state statute. Let me ask you this. Uh, I'm going to jump in here and just throw this question at you. What courts do we have to follow? Why do some people cite U.S. District Court as binding? What parts of the country require us to follow uh, that? Um, who makes the decisions on what's persuasive and what's binding? Um, and, you know, that's probably where I, that's a good question. People often cite things, you know, for example, in New Jersey, we don't follow anything out of our district court. We, we just, it's never, it's never cited. It's never followed. Yeah. From federal court. Right. So we don't have district court. So what I say federal court, we have an appellate division. We have a, uh, in us Supreme court, I'm sorry, a New Jersey Supreme court division here for our higher divisions of, um, court. And then we obviously were in a district. What are we? Third district. First district? I think you're in the third. third yeah, I think we're the third. Circuit. Third circuit. So you have the U.S. Uh, district Court, U.S. District Court of Appeals, and then obviously at the top of the chain is going to be the U.S. Supreme Court, which applies to everybody. So maybe you can help all of us understand excellent, that. Excellent question. I get this one all the time, too. Um, so, you know, so let's, if we're talking about the federal constitution, let's go that route first. So the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, obviously, that's the top. Okay, anything that they say, regarding the Fourth Amendment, um, the protections that it affords, or what police officers can and can't do. Uh, that's binding on every single court nationwide across the country. Um, and then the, the court right below the, the U.S. Supreme Court are your federal circuit courts of appeals. There's 11 circuits plus the District of Columbia Circuit. This is where uh, it gets a little, it varies from state to state. So I'll, I'll set that aside just for a second. You have your federal circuit courts of appeals, and then your, your lower court is your federal district court. That's your trial courts. Every, every state has numerous district. Well, most, most states have numerous district courts. All right, so you got your federal circuits, which comprise multiple states. So like you said, New Jersey is in, the, I think, the third circuit. Um, I think that's Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey. I think that might be it. So we're in the fourth circuit here in Virginia. Then you have your state courts. Every state has trial courts. They have at least one appellate level court. Some of your smaller population states only have a Supreme Court. Um, most states have a mid-level appellate court as well. Um, they can decide federal issues and they can also decide state issues. Now your state Supreme Court, or your, whatever your highest level court is in your state, that's the final say on your state constitutional issues. The U.S. Supreme Court cannot uh, over, what was the Pennsylvania case that came out recently that limited the, the automobile exception? I forget the name of it, but it was the big one on the group. Mm -hmm. uh, that one limited the automobile exception in Pennsylvania. Well, I got many questions. Well, can't the U.S. Supreme Court overturn that? No. It was decided under the Pennsylvania state constitution. Their search and seizure provision of their constitution is more restrictive than the Fourth Amendment. So that's the end of the line is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Now, if, that's, if that provision was somehow unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment, then it, it could be overruled, but it's not because it provides more protection. Mm -hmm. Federal Circuit Courts of Appeals, the, the one step below the U.S. Supreme Court. Most states, most state courts, like your state Supreme Court or your appellate court, they consider the Federal Circuit Courts non-binding on them. Meaning just because the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals decides the Fourth Amendment issue, say, and of course it's gonna be in a federal case, it's not binding on Virginia Supreme Court or the Virginia Appellate Court. However, most states, including Virginia, they're highly deferential to those cases, so to those courts. So they will look at an opinion from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and on, if the issue is very similar to what we're trying to figure out here in Virginia, they're going to give a lot of de deference to their decision and are very likely to rule consistent with that. Now, they're free to rule differently on this Fourth Amendment issue, but they're very likely to rule. They're highly persuasive, I should say. There's a handful of states that have held through their own state courts that they're binding. Uh, I think Alabama or Mississippi, one of those two I know uh, has held, their Supreme Court has says whatever the, I think it's the Sixth Circuit, Fifth or Sixth, I can't remember. Whatever they say, it's binding on our courts. Oh, and that's like a, that's a principle. 
Yeah, that, as as a matter That's of law. State law, yep. Anything that this this federal circuit court of appeals says on this particular issue, we're going to follow it here. Um, it's binding on us. It may as well have come from the Supreme Court is basically what they're saying. And then there's a few that just consider it just persuasive. Um, they're free to 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 interpret their interpret their their own way. But I consider the federal courts of appeals. The circuit courts of appeals, very significant sources of constitutional law. The vast majority of your Fourth Amendment cases are decided actually in your circuit courts of appeals, definitely not the U.S. Supreme Court. Could you rely on some of those? Like, let's say if you had a, if we had an area, could we rely on what the courts have said even outside of our circuit courts? Sure, they would be considered persuasive. So uh, in Virginia, anything outside of the Fourth, we're going to give high deference to the Fourth Circuit. But if the Third Circuit up there uh, in, in your area has decided a similar issue, uh, maybe the Fourth Circuit hasn't addressed it, but uh, the Third Circuit has. And it would be considered persuasive. It's not going to be binding. We don't give it that same level of deference. Um, but it would certainly be a case, if I was a prosecutor, I would certainly cite that if I don't have anything in our Fourth Circuit. We're going to look to the Fourth Circuit first. Mm -hmm. and, and why would why do some states, when they rule uh, or when there's an argument made, are they looking in other states or at other courts? Uh, you'll see sometimes maybe in Texas, they're citing case law to New Hampshire. Is that because the topic hasn't been discussed anywhere else? They just, they're, they're kind of going over, well, they heard that there. Let's see what they said. Exactly. We have never had this particular issue come before us here in Texas, for example. Um, there's nothing from the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court. There's nothing maybe from the, the circuit that we're in. So let's go and look at other states and see how they have decided it. Um, and so they'll collect the cases from the other states that have decided the issue, uh, looking at their analysis of the issue and try and figure out, well, we think this is more persuasive than the other. Uh, they certainly aren't binding uh, on any state courts are not binding on anything outside of their own state. But, um, yeah, they frequently do look to other states if it's a first impression case uh, in their particular state. Cool. I mean, this is good. It's good stuff. Uh, people are often confused. Um, you know, I just had a guy before he said to me. Uh, literally I, I got to five emails. I was just trying to show, I have an assistant here. I was trying to show her to do my emails. And I said, well, I can answer this one real quick. Some of the legal questions you can leave around. I'm going to try to get to them. It's very difficult. I, time is, is insane right now for me. And he said, uh, okay, so do I have to do the trooper two step in North Carolina? And, and the same one right before that was a guy from Virginia he says, do I have to do the trooper two step in Virginia? Uh, actually a guy messaged me on, on Facebook who I know this guy can. And he said, I'm in uh, another instructor's course, do I have to do it in Virginia? I said, he goes, did the law change? I go, you've never had to do it in Virginia. What happened was you went to a course being taught by somebody from a state that requires this to be done, or that's how they've resolved the issue of voluntariness and not being constrained. And that, you know, vol voluntary consent could not be ever given while in custody in those states. And then it just becomes a habit and actually a moot gesture. Would you agree that, you don't have to do this. You're just being told to do this because the guy who taught you from the other state, that's what they have to do. And respect. And it's it's not that I'm saying that these instructors did it intentionally. They're probably not taking into account that, okay, it doesn't have to have, be in Virginia, right? Just like I take into account when I go to Kansas, I'm like, hey, you got to do this in Kansas, okay? You don't got to do it in Jersey. You don't got to do it in Virginia. You don't got to do it in Florida. You have to do it in Kansas. Here's where it says why. They actually prescribe in Kansas. I taught there last week. They literally say exactly. I said I said the case law to you. Yeah, yeah. What exactly what they would suggest would have been a better way to go about getting voluntary consent in a case that was overturned at the Supreme Court level. So yeah, that, that trooper two step issue, you know, it's never it's not a it's not an issue that the U.S. Supreme Court has ever explicitly held one way or the other, and I highly doubt it's something that's ever going to come to their attention. Um, but what you know, the case that that that's going to control on this is what's it's Bustamante and and Robinette. Um, to you, you know to say the first part of that. How do you say is it? Schlenkloth? Uh, Schneck, Schneckloth? Schneckloth. Schneckloth. I, I could never get that right. I think it's Schneckloth. Schneckloth um, Bustamante. And, and so, what? Well, what those two cases deal with, Schneckloth talks about it's the totality of the circumstances uh, cons, uh, for, for consent. It has, just has to be voluntary. It doesn't have to be knowing. Okay. It's not like a, a waiver of your Miranda rights. It's not a waiver of your rights. It's just a voluntary act. So, it just has to be given voluntarily. That's what Schneckloth is about. Uh, and then Robinette talks about um, what what constitutes a break in custody from a traffic stop transitioning to a consent uh, count encounter or consensual uh, contact. You don't have to have the trooper two step. It's just something you can do. 
to show that you know a reasonable person would think they're free to leave. Um, I think there's a lot of other ways to do it. Telling them they're free to leave is a great thing to do. Uh, although Robinette says it's not required. Um, I think what better way to convince a reasonable person they are free to leave is if you tell them they're free to, they're free to leave. Yeah, if you're in a state that you do that. I mean, you don't need to play that game in New Jersey. I, you know, it, you're on your investigative detention. New Jersey said, as long as you explain it the way we, we suggest that you explain it, you don't have to tell people they're free to leave to get voluntary consent. You got to give them all their documents back. And it may, there just has to be a clear division that the traffic stop component of this is over. And now we're transitioning and just two people having a conversation is basically what it, what it is. But if you had, if you had uh, now existing reasonable suspicion of criminal activity, you wouldn't need a break in that. No, you don't. Yeah, you can just, yeah, once, if I've, div- if during the course of my traffic stop, the temporal course, the time of my traffic stop, I develop reasonable suspicion of some other type of activity, probably criminal activity, then the whole trooper two-step, the uh, Robinette, Schneckloth, it's all out the window because now I can detain the person and, and investigate this new suspicion. I don't have to end the traffic stop. I can now, I'm expanding the traffic stop to a different matter. So yeah, and, yeah, and the RS is there. You're, it changes the game. Yes, but in, the, in, those, in those other states like Kansas, even with the reasonable suspicion, they still want that break in custody, consider voluntary consent to be voluntary because somebody in custody could never, even investigative attention, could never be voluntary. Which so is, you've got to play this dumb game. Completely contrary to the Supreme Court case law, Watson, the United States versus Watson makes it right. clear. And, um, and by the way, if you actually check Watson in Kansas, which I did, they're like, yeah, you can't do this here. You can't do a, they're not, they're, like you'd really have to cover your butt if you had somebody in custody to get to grant consent, you'd have to cover your butt tremendously in Kansas. And I imagine it would be a long explanation and the same question 14 times. Or, you understand right. that we're not going to do it. You know what I mean? It's going to, this, that's what I think. And, and again, I have, this to you. I, I have this in my mind. Maybe there's another solution. Unfortunately in Kansas, because the Kansas, because the trooper two step was done there. They're stuck with it. It almost has binding ruling on it, but in other States where they, where they, you know, they consider it, some states say, like, look, that's one way to do it. I'm curious if there's another way to do it. And I think there is, you know, yeah, what it- back their documents. I like you're free to leave. I like to have that said in there, um, although it's not it's not required. I'm not, when I teach um, recruits, that's what I you know, tell them you're, you're free to leave. Tell them you're free to leave. Give them their documents back. Um, I like the lights being off on the car behind you. You know, the, the strobe lights turn those off, you know, before you walk up there. Just, you know, just uh, would a reasonable person think that the the traffic stop is over? Uh, sure. You're talking about to re- to reinitiate a consensual encounter. Yeah, it, to to reinitiate it, there doesn't have to be a physical break in custody. That's where the trooper two step comes in. There, ha- that's the physical break. Oh, I've walked away. Now I've turned around and I'm coming back trying to reinitiate a, a contact. That's just simply not necessary under the Fourth Amendment. It's it's something. It's a factor. Certainly is a factor to consider. But I just you know I don't think it's. I think it's kind of silly, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And you know what? Um, even some states like South Carolina, they had a piece of case law I read. It's very interesting. And they said this trooper or the sheriff did this thing that we've never seen. We don't know why he did that. And I wish I could have been there. I said, because he took a training course from a guy or heard from a guy who went to a training course. This is how we're supposed to do it. Who came from a state where it's required. That's why he was in South Carolina's like, you know, South Carolina Supreme Court said, you don't got to do this. So, you know, just getting consent would have been fine as long as it's voluntary consent and knowing and intelligent, whatever they, whatever the requirements are. Um, Not even know. would have been plenty. Free of coercion. That's that's the standard. Yeah, free that's it. Yep. Hey, listen, some states require a a, a, a a very small standard to for what's a voluntary consent. And some states, they don't like consent. You know, I mean, some acknowledgments of a, of a, of a um, unequivocal response, which means a yes or a no. They're like, he said, mm-hmm, that was a yes. You bring it to another state, they're like, yeah, you needed a yes and an acknowledgement of it. So it's just, it's interesting. And this is another area where state law um, comes into play. You know, I imagine the Kansas stuff you're talking about is going to be a, under just decided under the Kansas Constitution because that stuff's clearly not required by the Fourth Amendment. And that's fine. Um, some states do require you to tell the person you have a right to refuse. Is is New Jersey one of those yep. states? Yep. Yep. U.S. So that- state versus Johnson, 1975. We actually they will not consider a consent voluntary unless they advise the right to refuse. 
which is so that is a requirement under the New Jersey Constitution. That's correct. And there's quite a few states that have that. Um, to go back to your Virginia question, someone was asking you about the Virginia and the two step. Virginia is one of about um, less than 10, maybe eight or nine states that have expressly held in, in um, by their Supreme Court that we follow the Fourth Amendment lockstep. There is no deviation in Virginia. Uh, our search and seizure provision of our constitution mirrors that of the Fourth Amendment. There's another handful of states that, that say that. So it's so easy in Virginia. I don't even teach Virginia constitutional law. I don't talk about Virginia appellate cases very often. I talk about Fourth Circuit and I talk about the Supreme Court when, mm -hmm. when I teach Virginia. Excellent. Well, let's go back to the automobile exception. All right. And so, uh, um, did you bring yourself a, like a little cup of water so you didn't get, you didn't get parched like the one I have here? Uh, you know yeah, what? Yeah. We we makeshifted, so we we've been kind of like tossing around. Uh, if you're not watching this on the video that we're recording, and you're hearing this on the podcast platform, uh, you could see my little makeshift street cop podcast studio here. We had to maneuver some of our new offices around, and I said, let's just tack this up with a few nails, and we we managed. And, and then Zach literally is, I got my first apartment in the background, <laughs> and I have my college degree. <laughs> you literally have I have my first apartment background. This is my office at work. This is my office at work. Come on, man. Can you put a picture up of your dog or something? <laughs> They're on my desk in front of me. Oh, I'm going to come. Listen, when I come down there, I'm coming into the office. I'm going to bring some of the girls here. We're going to go to Pottery Barn. Right on We're the wall. Make it look good. We'll, we'll, we'll decorate the wall. It'll be nice. We'll make put some nice stuff up. We'll make an afternoon. <laughs> All right, good. All right, so let's go back to the automobile exception. All right, so we talked about... Um, uh, not no exigency requirement. Okay. So that means the vehicle doesn't have, there has to be, we don't have to show that somebody can get in the vehicle and drive away. So that means an unoccupied vehicle, no one near it. As long as I got probable cause, I can search it. Okay. Now, does that mean I have to do that? Does that present problems uh, trying to prove uh, possession? If I find a true proven element of a crime, if I find evidence, sure. Just saying that legally you can search it. Containers in the vehicle that comes up all the time. Uh, this is I'm going to back up for a second before you go to containers. Let me just back up a little bit because I'm going to play the role of the person who's hearing this. And, um, you know, a lot of people are new at this game and they're hearing these things. They will often misinterpret things, especially newer people. Let's just talk about before we move on from the parked automobile. Does it matter where it's parked? All right. So, um, yeah, let me. It does, but it doesn't. I'm going to tell you how generally it does not matter. OK, so it doesn't have to be on a, a highway. It doesn't have to be on a truly a public area. The Supreme Court has never held in any of the two dozen uh, automobile exception search cases that the location of the vehicle is determinative as to whether you can search it or not. Most of them have just happened to be roadside searches um, or at least initiated on the roadside or other publicly accessible areas like parking lots and things like that. Um, there was a case that came out a couple of years ago, Collins versus Virginia, that dealt with a vehicle search. It actually was a motorcycle but it was on residential curtilage. And the officers searched the motorcycle uh, on the curtilage without a warrant. Um, there was nobody there. So there was no exigency that the home was unoccupied at the time. They had the probable cause that they needed. If they had gone and gotten a search warrant, they, it would have been issued on the facts that they had. But they conducted without a warrant. Um, and then the argument, one of the arguments that Collins made was it was an unlawful search, therefore the evidence should be suppressed. Well, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia argued automobile exception. We've got probable cause. It's an apparently operable vehicle. That's all you said we need. Uh, LeBron and Dyson. So, um, and, but Collins's argument was, well, that would be true if the motorcycle was parked on the side of the road. Uh, or in a parking lot, or, or you pulled me over on a traffic stop. So on my residential curtilage, it was literally leaned right up against the house. No arguing that it was curtilage, that, it, that it wasn't curtilage. Um, so what the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately held was that the search was unlawful because of the entry onto the curtilage. Had the officers been lawfully on the curtilage for any number of other reasons, maybe they were there to do a knock and talk, maybe they were there investigating another criminal a, a crime, and they happen to be lawfully on the curtilage, armed with the same probable cause that they had, they could have searched the vehicle without a warrant. Okay, now the court didn't say that. Okay, and I'll, I'll cite a case that says you can in just a second. But the, all the Supreme Court says was that the entry onto the curtilage without a warrant was the violation. Um, because it's the curtilage receives that same type of level of protection that the home receives. Um, so to go on the curtilage, they needed a true exigency, consent, or a warrant. 
But had they been there lawfully, it would have been a lawful search. The Supreme Court has never specifically addressed searches on curtilage, uh, whether the automobile exception extends there. But the vast majority of lower courts that have addressed the issue have upheld the searches. Um, there's a case in, in out of the Fourth Circuit called U.S. versus Brookings. That was a, it was clearly a residential curtilage case, no exigency. The officers were already lawfully there. They developed PC to search the vehicle. They searched it without a warrant under, on the automobile exception. It was a lawful search. So Collins was about the entry, not the. What search. about the lifting of the tarp? It was yeah. So the the lifting of the tarp. So in Collins, the motorcycle was covered by a tarp. Um, both sides conceded that the lifting of the tarp was the search of the bike. That was that was the extent of the search because they were looking for the VIN and some other identifying characteristics. So, uh, and I think rightfully so, the Commonwealth did not argue that that wasn't a search. It was, it was an intrusion upon that, that, um, that effect, that vehicle. So the Could search you, was the lifting of the tarp. What if you had a car parked on the street and it was tarped, would that make any difference? No, as long as you, it would make a difference as far as to whether you need a warrant. As long as you have probable cause that under that tarp is evidence or contraband and that appear, that's an apparently operable car or motorcycle, then yes, you can lift the tarp, which is a search of the, the vehicle itself, as long as you have the probable cause. So it's to, to f- have fixed uh, Collins v. Virginia, if the people or detectives, whoever it was that, that responded to that household had advocated that they were going to do a knock and talk. And as they walked up onto the curtilage of the property to do that knock and talk, they looked to the left, saw the motorcycle, and then said, ah, yes. can we look, let's take a look at it now. Would that have been okay? Yeah, as long as the motorcycle was in a, a place that during the knock and talk, you, you could have been. Like if it was in the backyard, if you're just going to do a knock and talk, you're going to the front door or whatever door normally looks like where the people enter the home. You can't just wander around the property. Right. Uh, but it, yeah, if it's in that area, the front door area, and they have the probable cause to search the vehicle, uh, it would have been a lawful search under the majority view uh, in the lower courts. Even lifting the tarp? Even lifting the tarp, yeah. yeah. Cool. The tarp was the search. Gotcha. Uh, the initial, the, it was the initiation of the search. So, gotcha. yeah. Excellent. Collins is, is not as significant, I think, as people uh, make it out to be. Well, people often will uh, will get new case law out, and they'll say, oh, my God. You know, and I try to remind everybody, uh, if you actually have a good, firm understanding of existing case law, the things that are being heard at our Supreme Court level now are so unique and specific that it almost will probably never apply to your circumstances. Yeah, there's a couple of them currently before the Supreme Court. There's a hot pursuit case, Lang versus California. The argument was just yesterday. Um, regardless of how they decide the issue, it's not something that's going to really impact every single day in law enforcement. It's a very small uh, subset of situations. Uh, there's one coming up with the community caretaker exception as to whether it applies to residences or not. The Supreme Court has only held that it applies to vehicles. Uh, that's why we can do inventory searches, for example. Um, but the, the cases, does the community caretaker exception apply to homes? Regardless of what they say, there's still an emergency aid doctrine exception. So it's, yeah, they're not, very rarely is any, even Supreme Court cases, are they really groundbreaking law changing cases? Miranda versus Arizona, Terry versus Ohio, Graham, Graham versus Connor. Those are the, the outliers. Um, it's usually, like you said, these little small issues that just have never really been resolved and that probably do need an answer. That's what most of these cases tend to be. How many, how many cases did the U.S. Supreme Court hear every year from a from an originating from the United States? And, and, and is it all Fourth Amendment search and seizure? Oh, yeah. So uh, year after year, the number that Kate, the court hears is, is decreasing. Uh, only a few years ago, it was it was roughly 100, you know, 80 to 100. Now they're down to, to in the 70s. They, they normally hear uh, and a very small, like single digit numbers of cases have anything to do with criminal law. Uh, criminal procedure. Uh, most of them have to do with statutory interpretation for federal cases. They have nothing to do with what, what you and I do on a daily basis. As far as Fourth Amendment cases, this year there are three, uh, which is a lot for one year. They're all small issues. Um, and I'm not counting qualified immunity cases, um, just just um, substantive Fourth Amendment cases. Mm-hmm. But year after, I mean, several years in the past, uh, they had none. So very, very few Fourth Amendment cases. They have a highly discretionary docket. They, they get to pick, uh, for the most part, what cases they hear. Mm-hmm. Don't pick very many Fourth Amendment cases because there are so many other issues that they're responsible for. Gotcha. All right, let's go back to the automobile exception. And you were going into now containers inside the car to include locked items and safes and all that jazz, correct? 
Yes. So um, this is an area of, of automobile exception jurisprudence that's changed over the years. Uh, change for the better, I guess, if you're a police officer. Uh, change for the worst if you're interested in privacy protections inside your vehicle. Uh, but as a criminal. Rule, as a criminal, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the rule now is pretty straightforward. Uh, it started with the United States versus Ross, then Acevedo, and then Houghton kind of just kind of cleaned up around the edges. Um, but if it's a container, it's first of all, if you've got probable cause to search the car under the automobile exception or probable cause in general, but it's probably going to be the automobile exception. Uh, and the container that you're thinking about searching could reasonably house the item that you're looking for. If I'm looking for drugs and it's a purse, drugs could easily be in a purse. Then you can search the item. I don't have to have a particular reason why I think it's in that container. I just have to have probable cause to search the car and the item that I'm looking for could fit in the place that I'm looking. Uh, Ross, in any case since Ross, has never made a distinction between locked or unlocked. Uh, Ross said all containers. Uh, if you've got PC to search the car, it includes all containers. So to me, all containers includes locked containers. Right. So I'm going to just jump in here and ask a few questions. Um, would you be, let's say you come across a parked vehicle or maybe a vehicle where the person has decided they're going to discard the keys or hide the keys from you or refuse to cooperate and lock the car door. Would you find it, Benny, uh, let's, let's start with this, just the car itself. Would it be a violation of the Fourth Amendment with your already authorized probable cause to search it? To maybe take out a lockout kit and unlock the doors to go inside of it. No, so I so the manner and it's a good question. The manner in which it, so first of all, you have probable cause to do a search for evidence, right? Um, the and so that's the first step, but also the manner in which we conduct the search also must be reasonable. So step one, I don't think would be getting the baton out and smashing the window. Step one would be something to the uh, akin to what you just mentioned, getting a lockout kit, something that's not going to damage the property. It's not likely to damage. Maybe look for the keys. Uh, maybe ask to have them unlock the car. But ultimately, ultimately, it may come to the point where we would need to break and uh, break into the car using a degree of, of force. Um, and that would be reasonable. But I think we would probably want to exhaust the less destructive beans before we resort to damaging the vehicle. But no, I have the authority to search the car one way or another. We're going to be getting in that car. People have asked me, what do I do in a situation where and, you know, I, I remind people in a motor vehicle setting when you're dealing with people who are involved in criminal activity. You're going to come across locked. You're going to get this one a lot. Oh, the trunk doesn't open. Oh, I bet it doesn't, right? You know, like that's 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 my favorite. Oh, the trunk doesn't open. Oh, it doesn't? Well, we're going to figure it out. Um, you'll have people with locked glove compartments and locked center consoles. If you're encountering locked glove compartments, locked center consoles, you have low level, but, you know, you are, and people say, well, how do I access it if I don't have keys or they're refusing to open it? What I say is it's the least intrusive means that you can possibly come up with. And it may be something like taking a screwdriver, uh, putting it in a crevice, prying it back a little bit, trying not to break it and shining a flashlight and to clear that anomaly or that place that you can't see. And that should do this. And, and listen, by the way, if you see what you're looking for in there, you see a handgun that's illegal or some kind of narcotics, you're going to be able to now access and use more force to retrieve it. Yes. Yeah, I have no issue. I don't see any legal issues with that, you know, and hopefully yeah. you're Hopefully you have good agency policies that cover these things. One of the other things that I, I, I work a lot on is policy development, um, risk management issues, and, and your agencies need to have good written policies. That oh, they don't. And they, and they don't. Yeah, it's, it's horrendous. Far between. But these are the kinds of questions that policies um, should, should answer. Um, so we don't have to, you know, resort to asking our buddy or, you know, asking the guy, working next to me who probably has no idea either we're just guessing mm -hmm. the, the guessing we need to take take the guessing out of a lot of the things that we do uh and we can start with good policy and then follow that with good training so yeah but, unfortunately uh there's a lot to be resolved and fortunately <laughs> that's how we get paid so <laughs> we uh you know we'll 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 continue to resolve issues because for whatever reason, we're looked at as a reliable source to create, develop policy, or interpret case law and advise uh, appropriately. And, and by the way, when I started nine years ago doing this, believe me, the things that I said, people were like, there is no way. You know, now here we are, and it's trustworthy, and you earn that trust. And, you know, I, I, I foresee Street Cop Training and this company, whatever this is going to be a branch of, uh, of this company, going, continuing going down that road of trying to resolve overall issues in law enforcement one thing i'll never endorse is the friggin bola rap uh, have you ever seen that thing we actually just uh had a demo a couple weeks ago here oh yeah so stand very still it's it's interesting it has its it has its place 
but it's not it's not an end all be all. Um, I don't even know if I you know listen. Bring the guys who make the bowler wrap to my office, and what I'm going to do is we're going to actually get into a situation where I'm coming to kick your ass. And let me know how that bowler wrap works. Yeah, I mean, the, the, they showed some body camera vid- footage of them being employed in the field, and I mean, it it works if you can get it around the person. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, and so, what I don't like about it is you're 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 painting a highly unlikely circumstance. And, a, and almost like a requirement to employ this thing as a alternative to using force that you need to use to achieve your objective. And you're selling this as a res, as a resolution to our problems in law enforcement. In reality, you're taking the current circumstances and you're, you're absolving responsibility by saying we have an answer and it's wrong because it's not a friggin' answer. That's the problem I have with it. It's actually not an answer. It's a tool that's an option, but it's a very few and far between for it to be an option. I would argue that the taser is a far better option than than a bowler wrap. I don't. I mean, we're. I don't know where we're going. What our position is on it. We just had the demo the other day, but um, you know, I don't. I don't foresee it being really a, a viable option in a lot of circumstances. But you know, I can see its use. Uh, I don't know if it, it's worth the price um, of outfitting everybody to have one because it's no good if we don't have it readily available. Yeah. Um, so, That's what we yeah. do in Jersey. Jersey got with the last to get tasers. Still, people don't have tasers here, and um, they gave them to supervisors. You know, the guys that sat at headquarters. The ones least likely to encounter someone. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Ridiculous. They, I remember they firmly, uh, when I was working, they finally got a taser deployment. One supervisor actually happened to show up to a suicidal subject, and they made a big thing about it in the news. Oh, they didn't have to employ deadly force. Look at the, We got the video, They, the whole nine, and it worked out great. You know, now I'm glad to see that uh, New Jersey has loosened its policies with the taser usage because it really is – for a temporary uncomfortability, it is a phenomenal tool. I'm very, very uh, much an admirer of a taser. A I think it's a great tool. I'm a huge proponent of it when, when used appropriately, and there's a lot of circumstances where they certainly are appropriate. They're actually very funny when you and your friends drink and do contact uh, yeah. tases. That's, that's, that stuff's hysterical, too. I can imagine. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll get some beers. Yeah. Bring your taser. <laughs> <laughs> See, All right, so let's go back. Policy would cover. We would cover that in policy, and we wouldn't have that. <laughs> Um, but back to the automobile exception. Um, one, I want to talk about one more thing about containers, because this is something that comes up sometimes uh, pretty frequently, I guess, is what about um, like belongings? Like if I'm searching the car because I find drugs and there's passengers in the car and they leave their belongings in the car, you know, can I search those? I don't have any particular reason why the, the front seat passenger is involved in criminal activity. Can I search her purse? And yes, the answer is yes. And that's Wyoming versus Halton. Uh, we don't have to, before we search an item, figure out if they're involved in the activity. If it's an item that could fit the, uh, fit the object, we can search it. Now, there is one kind of a area where the answer is not clear. What if it's a female, she gets out, she's carrying her purse with her, and I've got probable cause to search the car, say, for drugs. Can I order her to put the purse back in the car or take the purse and search it? Uh, as part of the search of the car. Uh, the answer is not entirely clear. Halton, she left the purse on her own. Um, there was a, a comment by, I believe it was Justice Breyer in a concurring opinion there where he questioned whether that would be lawful and I tend to agree with him. Uh, it's more closely associated with her person now that she's, she, she's carrying it with her. Um, we can certainly order her to leave it in there for safety reasons, but I would question whether we could search it uh, without probable cause directed towards the purse. If I've got PC to believe there's drugs in the purse, then yes, under probably an exigent circumstance or search incident arrest theory, we could search it. But would you, often. maybe with the discovery of uh, the narcotics in the car, what would it, how much narcotics would you have to find in the car to now maybe fall under some kind of Maryland v. Pringle constructive possession circumstances? Uh, would, 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 would it being found on her side of the vehicle now give you the ability to arrest her? and maybe search that bag incident to arrest? You certainly could. Pringle was a real unique case. Um, not really sure why the Supreme Court agreed to hear that case, but it, uh, it was a probable cause case. They found dr- The officers found drugs. I believe it was a consent search. Found drugs in the glove box. Quite a substantial amount. I'm sorry. They found Narco- drugs. money. Yeah, yeah money. Yes, in the dr- dr- uh, glove box and drugs on the back seat armrest, kind of tucked in the back seat armrest. Um, distribution levels of drugs. Uh, backseat passenger, two folks in the front, nobody claimed ownership. The officer arrested all three of them on a constructive possession theory, I guess. And eventually Pringle confessed that it was his post Miranda post arrest. Uh, he argued that he should never been arrested in the first place. So what he was trying to do was have his confession thrown out. 
Uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, that was probable cause to arrest everybody due to where the drugs were found. Anyone could reasonably, any of those people could reasonably have accessed them. There was the amount of money that was in the glove box. The Supreme Court talked about drug dealers don't normally invite non-drug people into cars with them while they're selling drugs. Um, so there were a lot of factors that went into it. So just finding drugs in the car is not enough to arrest everybody. You've got to have some reason to believe they're actually, they, they, they're in a knowing possession of those, those items. But so it, articulating, it, right? And I, you know, people ask me, well, what do I do? I mean, well, I don't know. It, you know, it's a very broad question and it depends on the circumstances. You know, have, do people drive around or bring in their grandma to, to church and have heroin in the car? Yeah. Are you, if you find it, are you arresting the 83 year old grandmother who's going to church? No, very, very different circumstances than three obvious user, uh, narcotic users with puncture wounds in their wrists. And, uh, you know, obviously signs of illicit drug use, maybe a different story being told there. So as long as you can articulate and, and provide some factual understanding, reasonable belief, right. Uh, that would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, it, Probable cause is all about probabilities, not possibilities. Is it possible grandma has dope on her? Sure. But is what, what's the probability of that under the circumstances that, I, that, that are in front of you? Uh, it's just like use of force. Every, every use of force incident, uh, every determination of probable cause, they're based on the totality of the circumstances in front of you. There's no bright line rules of when you can shoot someone, you know, or when you can use a taser or when you can search a person's person. Uh, it's, it's fact specific. You need probable cause and it's based on the facts in front of you. So it is hard to give an answer. Well, what can I do here? Well, I need to know, literally, I would need to know all of the facts in front of you. And then we could probably work on a, a course of action, but mm -hmm. very fact specific. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. Let's continue on. Um, okay. So containers, I think we, we covered a uh, lot. You, you got Houghton, you got that. Mm -hmm. Houghton, we got Ross. Oh, uh, how about uh, vehicles in police custody? That's a cool one. Uh, yeah. So once we have uh, obtained full possession of the vehicle, that maybe we arrested the driver, we've towed the vehicle to the impound lot, or maybe we're on the side of the road, whatever, uh, that doesn't matter. Again, there's no exigency requirement under this uh, automobile exception. Um, United States versus Johns was the most recent case that talked about vehicles in police custody or items taken from vehicles in police custody. As long as you still have that probable cause and you could have searched the vehicle on the side of the road, just because you have taken the vehicle to a secure area uh, and it doesn't matter how long ago the, the seizure was made, it, the automobile exception has been uphold, upheld for searches that have occurred days, even weeks. Yeah, later. three days, yeah, right? Wasn't John's three days? John's was three days. There was a Fourth Circuit case that was something like 27 or 28 days. Um, as long as that probable cause is there uh, and it's still a, a vehicle that looks like a normal functioning operating vehicle, that really is all you need. I'm going to jump in here and just uh, add this caveat that it, there are some states that do not follow this. They depart from it. New Jersey's one of them. Ohio's one of them. Yes. So you have to check if you're listening. To this. Yeah. If you're if you're from a state, you'd have to check what the rules are regarding it. But if you can't find anything on it explicitly, you could follow what the uh, U.S. Supreme Court or U.S. District Courts have said and comfortably rely on that. I had another question for you. I have two. Let's talk about you pull up on a car crash. The thing's wrapped around a pole. It's clearly disabled. Will the automobile exception apply in those circumstances? It does. There's There have been numerous uh, lower court of cases that have said um, it's not just that, is it operable now? Was it just very recently operable or used for transportation purposes? Um, and specifically talking about crash um, investigations, officers don't necessarily, they're not just necessarily looking for act, uh, criminal activity when they search the car. Um, officers have an obligation to find out the cause of the crash. Um, another reason why it would be justified without a warrant, there's an exigency associated with that. So yeah, just because the vehicle has been uh, damaged or is, is completely interoperable due to a, a crash, the automobile exception does extend to those vehicles because it was just recently used as a transportation um, vehicle. Good thing I brought that up because I'm going to, have to change some things in my program. Because I have said to people, uh, you know, these are circumstances where you're starting to lose exigency. Well, then you, you would want to look at state law, though. Again, is there any state law deviation? But the, the federal circuit courts are, are in agreement on this. Um, obviously, no Supreme Court case on that. Right. And I don't know if you'll hear it at the Supreme Court ever. No, again, I don't. I don't know why that would come up. There's no disagree. There's not a lot of disagreement on the lower courts, so they're not likely to take that up. Next one. Here's a good one. Um, the the persons, the driver or the occupants of the vehicle are arrested 
and then maybe even secured the back of a police car or transported back to police headquarters for processing. How about now? Does that stop? Does our search stop at this point? Nope. Still the same thing. Um, there was uh, Chambers versus Maroney was an arrest case um, where the, the, the that was the first case from like 1971 or 69, something like that. First case where the court held that just because you've towed it away to another location and the drivers have been arrested, if they can't reasonably access the vehicle anytime soon. Yeah, you can still search the vehicle under the automobile exception where the, the location of the person that was driving or was in it is really irrelevant for purposes of the automobile exception. Now it is relevant for search incident to arrest, which probably is a good topic for a whole nother uh, podcast. Yeah. Uh, but, but no, it doesn't matter where, what you've done with the occupants, as long as you have the requisite probable cause and it's a vehicle that has, looks like an operable vehicle. Yeah. You don't need a warrant. The law You're, is clear. Write notes down on your pad of, uh, next podcast we'll probably bring up, or in the future, the search incident to arrest exception yeah. under Arizona v. Gantt. Uh, all deviation there too. Oh yeah. Well, we don't. Uh, did you read the Jersey one where it says we don't even have it? Yeah, it basically is non-existent uh, unless the ve- an occupant could access an arrestee could access the vehicle, which I don't know why where that circumstance would present itself. Let me ask you this: How about this one? Um, you arrest somebody next to their car. You put them in handcuffs. Are you doing a wingspan search of the car, like a Maryland v. Bowie type of deal? Um, yeah. So Michigan versus Long says that as long if you have a lawfully stopped vehicle and reasonable suspicion to believe the vehicle in the vehicle is an immediately accessible weapon, yeah, you can do a wingspan search. This is where the wing. This is the wingspan search. Search incident to arrest is not the wingspan search when it comes to vehicles. Again, we'll talk about that later. But um, yes. If the person is arrested, did you say arrested or just detained? Arrested, yeah. If they're arrested, I, I, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to do a wingspan search unless you have other occupants in the vehicle. Because the theory is uh, the person could be returning to the vehicle at some point and could access uh, access uh, a weapon. So if this is just a detention of the person, yes. But if it's an arrest with no other occupants, then I don't know. I don't think a wingspan search, which is a search for weapons, yeah. would be reasonable. Well, so there's there are some people in the field, and I was actually advising this yesterday in my class that uh, one of the gentleman's coworkers in another state, not in New Jersey, what he does is when he arrests people, he then does a wingspan search of the area near the car where he's at, and that includes like just the front seat, take a quick look underneath. And I said, yeah, this is a real bad idea, and it's not following what you're saying. This reasonable belief that the that the vehicle essentially is armed and dangerous. Exactly right, and even if it is the danger is associated with the person accessing the weapon and you right. now have controlled that person from accessing. So would you say under long, the ability, the, the ability to check that vehicle has a lot to do with the fact that people are getting back into the car yes. or the access to the car. Yes, there has to be. Yes. The, the, the fact that someone either will be going back to the vehicle or could very likely go back to the vehicle is a huge factor. It, it's <laughs> it, the determining factor right. uh, that if you don't have that possibility of access, then we don't even need to go into, do I have RS to believe there's a weapon there? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no possibility of access. No. Under, I, under long. Under interesting. Long. Uh, you know, it's interesting for me is like, as I sit here, all you know, the years and years of questions being posed to me that I'm just volleying back to you for good answers. And, and, and the reason I do that is because I want people to understand that here we are. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I consider myself a legal expert. I know more than most people. I consider you a legal expert much more than I do. I, I do have a better understanding than far majority of people in this field and probably in the in the legal field regarding Fourth Amendment search and seizure. Absolutely. Because I read it. I mean, I've, I'm an intelligent guy. I read it. I didn't have to. And I reminded folks yesterday about a huge class in uh, East Rutherford, New Jersey. When you have Esquire at the end of your name, all it told me is that you took a test and passed it. Uh, you attended law school. For the people listening, how many how many courses, Zach, as you're finishing your law school uh, journey, yeah. how many courses did you take in law school regarding Fourth Amendment search and seizure? Uh, yeah, let me yeah let me I'll talk about law school. Uh, none. So um, <laughs> law school has value. Uh, you know, I think the biggest value that I've gotten out of law school is is they te- you you're taught how to think uh, and analyze a case. Uh, how to look for issues and, and look for counter arguments. It's not so much black letter law and substance. Like you learn this stuff, but um, like a constitutional law class, for example, you may 
talk about Terry versus Ohio. You'll talk about Matt versus Ohio. Um, but the majority of your, your semester in constitutional law, you're going to be talking about um, not the amendments, but you know the, the, um, the, the first three articles of the Constitution. You're going to talk a lot about the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment. Very, very little criminal procedure is taught in law school. Now, there are specific classes you can take, but they're usually electives, like a, like a Fourth Amendment class or criminal procedure that deals with substantive law versus um, um, just procedural issues. Very little, very little. I, I've contended for years that the average police officer um, with, you know, seven to 10 years of experience in field policing um, knows more about the Fourth Amendment than your average prosecutor or defense attorney, maybe even a judge, depending on their background. It's because we, we live it. We're in, uh, we do search and seizure every single day. A prosecutor may do a motion to suppress maybe a couple of times a week where they have to make a Fourth Amendment argument, depending on your jurisdiction. Um, but, but yeah, you, we, we're in the field of, of search and seizure every day. Prosecutors, they're not. Defense attorneys are not. Um, yeah, I um, I just want people to understand that, you know, if you wanted to be really well versed and fluent with this as an attorney, you'd have to commit to reading uh, additional case law after you graduated in pol and procedure. My wife's uncle, who, you know, he's he's a defense attorney. He was a prosecutor for about seven or eight years here, and he's been practicing law, I'm guessing, like 19, 20 years. Real good guy. I mean, real good friend of mine. You know, he'll awful often give me accolades, but some of the things he said to me about the the inside look of what's going on behind the scenes is, you know, Dennis, I I I don't know any attorneys that know what you guys know at this training company because nobody reads case law unless they really have to. They're not going to trial. It really is a yeah. They don't they don't want to. They don't have the time to. Uh, they're not going to trial. Nobody can afford trials. They don't know how to argue trials. So just some food for thought, everybody here. You know, you need to rely on yourself for self-taught stuff or know where your reliable sources are. If you're getting advice from somebody and it sounds a little fishy or impractical, I would, I would ask, uh, do you have this in writing where I can read this thing so I can better understand it? We want to have a diplomatic approach to this stuff. We don't want to be overstepping our bounds, but certainly I don't want people just bowing down to uh, unprecedented authority or cl self-claimed authority on I know what I'm talking about. The question is, do you actually? Mm -hmm. And we are always willing to have the conversation, explain our position, just like we did today, to help you better understand what we're talking about. So if you heard things in this podcast episode that you think were, that you're, um, you know, maybe you're being told otherwise or you're in disbelief of, we're open to having the conversation. We have a lot of humility. We would love to hear what your position is. Often what we hear is somebody who misinterprets case law. They are, and we know that even from other legal professionals we have conversations with, they're misinterpreting case law. And we try to give clarity. And, and you know, I, I, I will say, I, I will turn it over to Zach for the ultimate clarification if I can't clarify something, which most of it I can, um, you know, and I'm still catching some things that I do based off of you. So I just want to remind everybody that, and I appreciate everybody being here. Zach, do you have anything else before we start wrapping this episode up? Um, I, no, I don't want to get into uh, occupants. That's a whole nother discussion. So we'll do that next week or whatever, the next time we get together and – We'll discuss occupants. We'll talk about search the vehicle incident. We've got a lot of topics to discuss. Zach Miller's class is on streetcop.com. Check us out. Join our Facebook group. It's free. We have an Instagram page you can follow. We have a LEO Instagram page as well. Zach's class is called Constitutional Policing. It's great. Uh, you'll see it all over the place. It is a very, very exclusive course. We limit it to about 40 people because of the practical value that you'll get. When you leave that two-day program, you're going to feel like you really have a thorough understanding of constitutional law and policing and how it applies to us. He's a phenomenal instructor. He's one of the first people, uh, just a handful out of the 25 instructors we have at this company who, when we saw him for the first time, there wasn't really much advice we had to give because he was just naturally very, very good and had a lot of skills at teaching what he teaches. So I don't know if you have anything else to add, uh, Zach. Without further ado, this is not the last time you're going to hear or see from Zach Miller. He is around for the long haul. We have a uh, intentional long-standing relationship for the future as well. We hopefully uh, will have a, a wonderful time together and provide, you know, we care about the value that we're delivering to you all to try to do this job better. So without further ado, thank you for listening to this episode. If you like us, go to Apple and give us a rating, like us, follow us, all that jazz. We'll see you next time at the Street Cop Podcast.